you know, there I am like looking in the mirror and here's this guy who's 50 pounds, 20 kilos overweight. And there's the blood pressure pills sitting on the sink and I'm anxious, I'm depressed and I don't want to do anything. I just want to like curl up under a blanket. Welcome to the Food Matters Podcast, your home for health and wellness. My name is James Colhoun, filmmaker and founder of foodmatters.com, and I am your host on this journey to inner and outer transformation. Hi, everyone. It's James here from Food Matters, and today we are going to be welcoming a special guest, and we're going to be talking about the gut. We're going to be talking about the microbiome. We're going to be talking about leaky gut, IBS. These are concerns that are impacting so many people in the world. And my guest today is, is an expert in this space. We're going to be talking about the role of food in gut health, fiber in particular. Um, his name is Dr. Will Bolshevitz, and he is an expert. He is a medical doctor, a gastroenterologist. He's published more than 20 papers in this space. He's the founder of theplantfedgut.com. Uh, he's written a book also called Fiber Fueled. And he's got a new cookbook coming out as well. And as a reminder, we cover many of these topics. So if you love this discussion, make sure to check out our Transcendence docuseries. It's streaming on foodmatters.com and Gaia.com. And if you're interested in taking the next step on studying nutrition online, you can check out the foodmattersinstitute.com to find out more. So, Dr. Will, how are you today? James, I'm feeling great, man. I am so excited to be here. And yes. um, very grateful. I'm very grateful to to have this conversation with you because um, let, let me ask you a question. When did Food Matters actually start? When did you start doing this? 2007, we were doing the research. Uh, 2006, we were studying seven filming and it came out in 2008. I mean, that's a long time ago now, right? You're crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people at that time told you you were crazy. They did. I mean, I remember Laurentine's sister with didn't mince her words. She said, good luck with that goji berry film. That was about it. You know, and, uh, you know, since then, many things that we spoke about that were very radical back then have been brought to prominence. I mean, intravenous vitamin C therapy and cancer is is quite commonly, you know, spoken about more research papers on it. Um, detoxification and natural therapies for chronic illness is is much more in the fray. Um, also, uh, things like, you know, superfoods obviously took off. I mean, goji berries, spirulina, and then even just highlighting the fact that foods are incredible, you know, and there's so many foods that can impact us in a positive way. So it's, um, you know, it's exciting to be a part of that and to still be around and, and making an impact. I think that the best work comes from a place where you, you are feeling compelled to do something, even if it's against your will. You're not yeah. being rational about it, and mm. you just know it's what you're supposed to be doing, and and because of that, you bring great passion into that work. And to imagine yeah. a person like coming forward with these ideas in 2007 is like that is mind crippling for me, because that's not where the world <laughs> was in 2007. You know, it took like you were 10 years ahead of the curve. It was a while off, yeah. What I wanted to say is that, on my personal journey. And we can dig into the sort of my whole story if we want to. But part of the story is that I entered into a phase in my career where I discovered I realized that my medical training, although it was at great American institutions, like some of the best hospitals in America, Georgetown, yeah. Northwestern, the University of North Carolina, yep. I came to the realization that there were flaws and that there were things missing that I needed to know. And that could potentially uh, be the critical piece, the missing piece for my patients. And yeah. so I, I started on a journey of starting to like, basically, I would work during the day as a doctor, and then go home and just like voraciously consume nutritional information at night, and then bring it into the clinic the next day and use it to treat the, some of the conditions we're going to talk about today, your bowel syndrome, or ulcerative yeah. colitis or um, acid reflux. But uh, I felt compelled to do something that felt radical to me in 2016 mm -hmm. and start an Instagram account. And it was the first time I spent any time on social media. And I was just trying to get this message out there that like, yo, 
nutrition matters. We shouldn't just be treating people with yeah. pills. And yeah. wow. one of the accounts I came across very early on in this process was Food Matters. And I learned from you. <laughs> so here I am. Well, please, I, I want to I be clear as well that most of my inspiration was in interviewing the world's leaders in nutrition and natural therapies. That was a big part for me. So that really inspired me. So you know, I used to work on ships and, and private yachts, you know, passenger ferries, tankers, container ships. That was my professional career before filmmaking and, and now nutrition. And at nighttime, I would study nutrition, you know, it's the same, the same thing. And it was like this secret, secret society. I was uncovering all this information. I was shocked that my dad didn't know about it because he was sick. I was shocked that his doctor didn't know about it. And I really, I really feel that, you know, there's that, you were in a position to be able to put it into practice. That was very different than me. I was able to interview people and, you know, share the film, you know, in different places, airlines, Netflix, and, and different languages. But you were able to go work with patients. What, what were some of the biggest things that you were uncovering early in your journey that have stayed with you? Um, you know, I know, I know Fiber is a big part of your story because, you know, that's the title of your book and your cookbook. Um, but what were some of the biggest things that were aha moments that, you know, with your background as an MD, all this prestigious study, and then doing the nutrition study, which first of all is shocking that you didn't really get that course of work offered to you. I mean, I know Mark Hyman talks about this. I know many other integrative practitioners talk about the shocking fact that there's not much nutrition uh, offered in terms of core subjects when studying to become a medical doctor. Can you speak to that? What were some of the biggest things you were uncovering at that time early on? Well, um, not not much. When you describe it as not much, believe it or not, you're actually overstating it. It's less than not much. No. It's, yeah. Uh, to put this into perspective, I um, I graduated medical school in 2006. I started in 2002. And I think it was 2003, I had two weeks of nutrition. And the two weeks of nutrition was not practical information, like how do you talk to a person who has congestive heart failure? Or how do you modify a person's diet who's got irritable bowel syndrome? You know, what they taught me was like, hey, here's the five symptoms of a B6 deficiency that you're probably never going to see or diagnose during your career. So that was nutrition. And um, well, so I think though, to answer your question, I went through a hard period of time in my life and it uh, turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I think that the, when the tables turn and the doctor becomes the patient, which is what happened to me, then it allows you to actually feel what your patients feel and to understand where they're coming from. And then it inspires you and it wants, it makes you want to be better. And I was in my early thirties. This was about 10 years ago. And you have to understand, like I was a great athlete in high school, played three sports and think of myself as an athlete. And you know, there I am like looking in the mirror and here's this guy who's 50 pounds, 20 kilos overweight. And there's the blood pressure pills sitting on the sink and I'm anxious, I'm depressed and I don't want to do anything. I just want to like curl up under a blanket and, um, believe it or not, like actually professionally speaking, everything was falling into place for me. Uh, I was yeah. like, you know, I won the highest award at my residency program out of 60 very accomplished doctors. And, but I didn't feel that way. I, I felt. I mean, extremely low self-esteem. So, you know, when you ask me like, what are some of the most radical things that you've seen? Let it start with me. Because yeah. I knew that the pills and the procedures in my doctor's bag were not going to fix my problem. And I needed something else, but I didn't actually have the training or the education to know what that was. So I tried exercising because I was like a typical early thirties guy. And I mean, when I say exercising, I mean, take this, you know, type a doctor and like, I mean, six days a week, an hour of weight of strength training, and then either a five to 10 K if it's the winter or if it's the summertime, 50 to hundred lengths of the pool. Yeah. Could get stronger, could run faster, could swim really far, could not lose the gut. 
And um, things changed for me when, ironically, I met the person who is my wife. And because we're like literally going on a first date together. Yeah. And she does not order off the menu. Instead, she says to the waiter, can you get me some of these collard greens and black eyed peas and some mashed potatoes and some green beans and just like arrange it on a plate for me? And my, my eyebrow went up. I was like, who is this person? Yeah. What, yeah. what is going on right now? And then I watched as she devoured this meal. She was just as satisfied as me. She was happy with her food. She looked amazing. She had control over her health. And we're done with the meal. And I have a hangover, but not from alcohol. Yeah. I have a hangover from eating regular food. And I need to go home and take a nap. She wants to do round two of the date. And so this opened my mind, James, to the idea that maybe the food that I eat, the food that I was raised on is actually the problem. And when I did change my diet, when I evaluated that all, as hard as it was, because I actually did like the food that I was eating, when I evaluated my diet, when I made changes, small changes, incrementally, but like sustainably over time, mm. I uh, actually was quite effortless in accomplishing my health goals. Nice. And so to, um, you know, to have that happen now, it's like, okay, I've stumbled upon something that's clearly very healing and I'm a doctor. My job is to heal. Yeah. So let me study this and then let me bring it into the clinic. And, you know, I, I can't even, it's hard for me to share all the stories of like, amazing transformations that have taken place, but um, putting ulcerative colitis into remission, permanent remission, uh, taking irritable bowel syndrome that's crippling and debilitating and making it go away, taking uh, a person who's on proton pump inhibitors chronically because they need them to not have acid reflux and allowing them to actually come off the medicine. Wow. These are not rare stories. These are just kind of people and you know experiences that they have so and i know that you've seen this because i'm quite sure that you've received countless messages from people in your community who have had uh transformations as a result of your work yeah indeed i mean and i think what a what a, i mean first of all what a powerful story and what what an angel to come into your life to offer you that that gift you know i think we uh we underestimate the power of, you know, signs and people in our lives. And, you know, if I reflect back on my father's transformation, he was depressed, anxious, overweight, 50 pounds um, on six different medications. And his doctor didn't mention anything about his diet. And then Laurentine and I lob up on his doorstep and basically start contrabanding certain foods in his uh in his cupboard and changing his diet and he had a radical transformation you know in three months wow. you know, off his medications and you know lost you know all of that weight and was back to normal after five years on just a cocktail of, of drugs and and this really the story you're telling me and the story of my father's transformation and many of the people in in each of our communities speaks to this idea that food is medicine you know and it's it was something that was not in your bag of tricks. You know, you had everything else except that, <laughs> that food prescription. Um, and that's, uh, that's exciting because it's cheap, safe, simple, and effective, but it's shocking that it's not normally the first port of call. And, um, you know, that's, uh, I mean, that's amazing that you're now, I'm, I'm certain, offering that as a first stage uh, and a first step for your patients. Um, but yeah, wow, what a, what a story. How, how is it, you know, what were some of the things that, so then you, you're doing this late night study, right? And then you're going in and working with patients now after having this, this um, 
angel awakening, let's say, this uh, mythical creature that orders not on the menu. I bet you felt a little <laughs> uncomfortable. You're like, damn it, this is the first date and she's already like demanding like crazy stuff from out the back. Go out the back, get me some black beads. <laughs> I need some collard greens. No, she was very, she's very, uh, she's very gentle. And, and so she was very okay. nice about it to the waiter, but it, but it definitely was like a shock for me because I'd never been around mm -hmm. anyone like this. Like I was like, who is this person? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, I, I get, I know that feeling, but I'm around those people all the time now. So it's sort of, it, it's become normal, but right. um, let, let's speak to what were some of the first big truths you were uncovering? Like what was some of the first big aha moments that you were starting to practice with on your patients and starting to see results with in terms of um, some of these gut gut conditions you're working with? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, so you know, part of what's been happening in the world in in my world as a gastroenterologist is a revolution is taking place. And you know, I think about because I. I feel like I'm turning into my dad, you know, I'm in my early forties and I'm like now becoming a student of history. I'm looking, I'm reading history books and stuff, super nerdy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's like kind of interesting to think about it. Wasn't that long ago that like, there was so many parts of the world that were just undiscovered mm. and you could be an explorer and go there. And now it's not that it's parts of the world that are undiscovered. It's that there's like, science that is being discovered that is transformative and in this particular case in my space as a gastroenterologist like i deal with digestive issues well our digestion is reliant on our gut microbiome and if you think about this sort of analogy of an explorer prior to 2005 2006 we knew basically nothing about these microbes and frankly we yeah. didn't really think that we should care because they, they make poop and they smell funny. So, but then around that time, 2005, 2006, right when you were starting to launch your brand, um, in the science space, there was this sort of radical transformation occurring where now we have the laboratory technique that we need to suddenly study these creatures. And um, we have computers that are strong enough. And imagine like all of a sudden, seeing something that you had never seen before and realizing that there are 38 trillion living microorganisms as alive as you and I are inside our colon, inside our large intestine. And they are truly an ecosystem by every measure of that definition in the same way that the Amazon rainforest or the Great Barrier Reef is an ecosystem. And they exist as a part of our body. And I think it's fair to call them an organ because they are connected to like truly the pillars of human health, digestion, our metabolism, our immune system, our hormones, our mood, our brain health, even the expression of our genetic code. They make up more than 50% of our cells. We are less than 50% human, clearly. Like, there's no question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they make up 99.5% of our genetic code. And um, we knew nothing about them until, like, less than 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. so now there's this explosion of science. And we're seeing things that are just, like, bending the brain on a routine basis. Um, even for me being a medical doctor and like this being my job, there are things that I'm reading, you know, every month that are just blowing me away. So, um, so an example of a study that really changed things for me is in 2014. I'm starting on this journey. 2012 is when I met my wife. 2014, I'm on, I'm starting on this journey and, uh, there's a paper that came out in nature medicine and they took a group of people and gave them five days of like basically polar opposite diets and they measured their microbiome on a daily basis. And these polar opposite diets, like you have to understand this is not, uh, this is 2014. There were no diet wars or if there were, 
they were on Facebook. Well, there was some. I mean, we, we were we were coming out of the '80s, which was the the you know the low fat you know diet, and then we were all into artificial like margarines and sweeteners. So we we were we were doing something at least, you know. But there but was it, less diet wars. I get it. You know, it yeah. wasn't like paleo versus like you know lacto over vegetarian or raw food or vegan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it wasn't vegan versus carnivore, which is what we currently got, yeah. right? So yeah, exactly, but the, the, the poor opposite diets that they chose were vegan versus carnivore because you can't get more extreme than that. And, yeah. um, so five days of whole of completely plant-based versus five days of completely animal-based meat, dairy, and eggs. Mm -hmm. And the, what's fascinating about this study is that literally in 24 hours, you are already changing your microbiome mm -hmm. and that's really empowering. Yeah. And within 48 hours, it's a pretty substantial change, actually. Mm. And um, what you see in this study is that your dietary choices make a difference. And so what I saw in this study was, to me, inspirational. That we have the ability within, like, our dietary choices today, by tomorrow, are already having an effect and shaping our microbiome. That's so awesome. We have control we have the ability to adapt it, to make it what we want it to be, to mold it like a piece of clay. So we are not victims. We are not cursed or stricken with a microbiome that hates us. Instead, it's super exciting to ponder that we have a microbiome that like wants to help us and it forgives us for whatever we've done in the past. <laughs> it's a very spiritual entity, right? It's like non-judgmental, forgiving, but it needs to be fueled like a spiritual practice needs to be fueled, whether it's prayer or whether it's meditation or whether it's exercise or going for a walk, you know, you need to do the work, but it's ready to help. I love that. I love that analogy. Well, and everything that you just mentioned, you mentioned like, like a spiritual practice and then you, and then you mentioned, you know, exercise or meditation or going for a walk. And the, the interesting thing about it, James, is that like post 2014, as we've started to study these different things that we think are spiritual practices, we discover that they're beneficial for the gut microbiome. Yeah, wow. Well. And that this is not this is more than just food. I would be um, remiss to come here and pretend that the only thing that matters is your nutrition. Your nutrition does matter, but actually, uh, you asked me a, a few moments ago about like crazy stories, so. Let me uh, share one real quick that just happened recently Great. where um, I had a patient who she has ulcerative colitis, young woman, single, wishes she could date, has diarrhea around the clock. It mm -hmm. destroys her life. She wakes up in the, night, in the middle of the night to go. She can't get a good night's rest. And um, ulcerative colitis, for those who haven't... Uh, Heard of this before it's an inflammatory bowel disease it's your immune system is actually attacking your microbiome and so anyway james like i'd been taking care of her for two years and this was recently um i'm pulling out my tricks like i'm doing everything that i got i'm doing the same things i talk about in my books yeah and she's not getting better <laughs> and um it was quite uh humbling and then one day recently, she comes in and I'm like getting ready to go in the room and I'm like, okay, I have to brace myself here because uh, it's frustrating because we're both trying really hard, but we're not making progress. Yeah. Walk in. She looks different. She's glowing. She has a smile on her face. I sit down. She says to me, Dr. B, I feel like myself again. I'm actually like back to feeling like myself again. And so her ulcerative colitis had gone into remission. It was like she didn't have it. And I asked her, what happened? Like what changed? Because I had, ch I had changed her diet, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And she says to me, I was in a job where I despised going to work on a daily basis. And I would go and my boss would verbally berate me and embarrass me in front of my peers. And 
it was really hard for me to do it, but I finally got the audacity to leave that job. And I found a new job and they treat me with respect. And so she exemplifies that we are so much more than the food that goes into our mouth. We like our food matters. There is no mm -hmm. question about that. Um, but we can do everything right. We can eat everything right. We can exercise and sleep and meditate. And we actually are far more complicated and we have to look at the whole human. And in this case, when you look at the whole human, you discover that what was holding her back was this um, sort of micro trauma that existed on a daily basis that she would walk back into like she's walking into a war zone. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, you know, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, that's an incredible story. And I, I just know that what really cracked me open was, you know, speaking with these experts like Bill, um, uh, Bruce Lipton, sorry, and then Joe Dispenza and the power of the mind and hearing this story, just the, the, the toxic work environment, the toxic relationships, the toxic situations that people find themselves in, the body just is screaming out and um, asking for help, you know, asking for change. Yeah. Do you suffer from gut health issues, chronic pain, or irregular hormones, and you just can't seem to find a solution? You're not alone. If you're listening to this podcast, you most likely value your health, feeling good, and want to be able to take the best care of yourself and your loved ones, and why shouldn't you? At Food Matters, we believe that your body is worthy of good care and that no one is more suitably qualified to care for it than you. This is why we have created a world-class nutrition program designed to help you transform lives, including your own. It's called the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program. Studying nutrition changed my life. It helped me cut through the confusion of paleo, veganism, plant-based, intermittent fasting, and more to experience lasting energy, vitality, and improved community. In the Food Matters Nutrition Certification Program, we've assembled the greatest minds, independent from big business interests, to share with you the most trusted research on nutrition and healing, including David Wolf, Dr. Mark Hyman, Andrew Saul, Krista Recchio, Dr. Libby Weaver, Dr. Alejandro Junga, and many more. So if you want to understand how to heal your own gut, balance your hormones, reduce inflammation and chronic pain in your body, then head over to foodmatters.com forward slash study to learn more and join the wait list to be the first to know when enrollment opens again. You will not regret this investment in your health. So, you know, up the top of this talk, your personal story, you spoke about how, you know, you were suffering with depression and anxiety and, you know, wanted to curl up into a ball. And, you know, I, I, I know of this type of experience personally. I mean, and I'm sure everyone's struggled with this at some point in their life, but to have it become chronic where it's long term can be really challenging and and you know for my father i call it uh bow maps which is probably a medical term you've never heard of because i came up with it and it's called burnt out middle age professional syndrome and you know it's like you said everything was going right in your career and you were not well you know and i feel like a lot of people will resonate with that and and so you know when we like, let's come back to the food for a little bit now, you know, what were some of the foods that you first started introducing and that you've come to, you know, to realize have the biggest impact? Like you, t you spoke about this study of like, okay, there's plant-based versus paleo. And, and I'm, I'm a very sort of non-dogmatic type person. I think different diets, different people, different stages of life, different conditions can all have certain impacts. And then there's always the honeymoon effect when people have a radical change in their diet, they always feel better for a period of time. So there's all of that, but in general, there's principles when it comes to um, the gut and the microbiome, I'm certain that you've discovered. Can we speak to what are some of the core principles that relate to just about everybody? Um, obviously we can't speak to individual specific people that are going through multi-systemic illnesses on this call, but what are some of the core principles that you've uncovered around foods to eat? Yeah, to well, and I'm glad you're framing it that way because the context matters for all of us. And so our individual context does uh, inform these conversations and we all have our own personal starting point and we all have our own personal journey and we have to find what works for us. 
and I celebrate people who have the audacity to change their diet regardless of the diet that they choose. Um, and, but what I do want to do though, is not, I, I agree. I don't want to be dogmatic about it. I actually think there's many different forms of uh, healthy diet, not necessarily the one that worked for me. So, but I do want to help to guide people using scientific principles that you can apply to your own life and find something that works. So, um, what I did was I'll, I'll just tell you the first change that I made. And then I started to double and triple down on this I'll, and I'll explain why. Mm -hmm. But I was at a point in my life where convenience was extremely important to me because of how busy I was. Um, so I wanted it quick, I wanted it um, cheap, and I wanted it to taste good. And that's actually what fast food will fulfill for us. So unfortunately, we have to pay the price after the fact. And I was going to a, a fast food chain in North Carolina, which is where I was living at the time. And for $4, I could get a double cheeseburger with with bacon on it, a uh, chili cheese dog, French fries, a beverage. I would get a Diet Coke. At least that doesn't have any calories. And uh, and then they throw in the apple pie. So that's a pretty good deal for 4 bucks. It's like, you know, 2,500 calories Jeez. in one meal. What year was this? I mean, this is pre-crazy inflation or the, the monetary policy that's changed the entire world. I don't know. Like, was this recent? Well, this was, I mean, this was 2012, but I don't think it's radically different okay. these days. I think the United States likes to okay. subsidize this type of food and make it cheap for people. They do. They do. Okay. Which is part of the problem. But, yeah. you know, nonetheless, so I needed convenience, James. I wasn't going to go home and cook some, you know, three-course meal. And, um, well, you know what's convenient? A blender. Blenders are easy. Yeah. And True. so I ditched the uh, stop at Hardee's and instead went home and pulled out the blender and threw stuff in it. And right. just like not even measuring or looking for recipes on the internet, quite simply just throwing yeah. stuff in it and then hitting the button. And um, what happened is when I replaced, you know, fast food with uh, a giant smoothie, like enough smoothie that it was probably, you know, I mean, honestly, like four or five big glasses. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, so what happened is that I instantly felt energized. I instantly felt lighter. I actually didn't have a hangover after the meal. I could go and work out an hour later. Mm -hmm. um, my skin started to clear up. My hair got thicker. My energy surged. This is like, we're talking within days. Mm. and then you start to have this play out over weeks and the you know gut that's sagging over the belt is now drawing in and eventually the belt needs to be tightened and um so now i started doubling tripling quadrupling down i started looking for other opportunities to make small choices i used to enjoy coffee yeah. with as much uh you know basically junk uh creamer like the stuff that doesn't yeah. even need to be refrigerated. <laughs> I don't even know how they yeah, do that. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and artificial sweeteners. And mm. I went from that to drinking a black. And it took me mm. four weeks and I've never turned back. And I, I actually mm. don't want to turn back. I like it black. So mm. anyway, so I started to make these changes. Now, what was happening? If I were to take you guys and and like basically, you know, we pull out a microscope and we zoom in as if we're looking at the inside of the intestines and tracking what's taking place. What yeah. you're going to discover is that the fiber that's in my diet, fiber, like I don't have the enzymes to break down and process fiber. Humans don't have those. Yeah. But, but believe it or not, the fiber doesn't just come out the derriere. It actually passes into the colon where it smacks into 38 trillion microbes yeah. and they feast. This is dinner for them. Their preferred food and they consume the fiber and they grow stronger. They become more capable of doing their job, which is supporting human health. And then what they do is they turn around and they actually do almost like a magic trick because fiber stops being fiber. And it turns into, so I've been studying medicine for 20 years. This is the most anti-inflammatory thing I've ever come across. These are the short chain fatty acids. 
so butyrate, acetate, propionate. And we get them through the consumption of fiber, meeting microbes in our gut. No way. No way. They're converting like this sort of what we call like non-digestible matter into these anti-inflammatory agents in the colon. A hundred percent. And they, we lack the enzymes. Okay. There's these, there's this class of enzymes called glycoside hydrolases. I'm a big guy, like two meters tall. And, uh, I have as big as I am 17 of these enzymes. That is a pathetically small number. <laughs> yeah. There are single cellular bacteria that have hundreds, hundreds of these enzymes. And if you take the collective pool, because our gut microbiome is not about actually the individual microbes, it's about how they work as a team. Mm. And you take this pool and you look at what are they capable of doing? Our estimate is that they have 60, thousand of these enzymes unique wow. enzymes that they can use to basically transform our food so yeah it's it's quite interesting james you know this is actually goes beyond fiber um mm -hmm. many, many people speak about the health benefits of polyphenols mm -hmm. you'll hear you know for example david sinclair who uh, is a longevity expert at harvard talk about resveratrol yeah which we find in red wine. Well, mm -hmm. first of all, resveratrol you'll find in many places. Uh, you can find in That's right. grapes and, and actually peanuts, yeah. believe it or not. <laughs> um, but what people need to understand is that resveratrol, if we didn't have a microbiome, would be very close to worthless. And it's actually the microbiome, just like in activating the short chain fatty acids, it's mm -hmm. the microbiome activating the polyphenols as well, including resveratrol. Wow. So they are, they are key players in not just digesting food, but actually in creating access to some of the most anti-inflammatory compounds that our body thrives on. And it comes from these mm -hmm. microbes. Wow. So w one thing, look, I'm just piecing this all together now. Y you're essentially saying, you know, we're feeding ourselves, we're feeding ourselves, but as importantly, we need to be feeding our bacteria. We need to be providing them with matter to thrive. You know, essentially fiber is what you're saying is their, is their food, you know, and, you know, that's a, that's a beautiful statement, you know, and then people go, well, what types of fiber and where do you get fiber? Well, I know that there's practically no fiber in animal products and there's plenty of fiber in plant-based products. And, you know, there's different types of fiber, you know, soluble fiber, et cetera. And then there's also this talk about like pre prebiotics, which is sort of like a type of inulins and fibers as well. Can you break this down for people and, and how can they make it practical? Is it just like put lots of things in a blender and drink it or eat lots more plant foods or is there more specifics around this? So you... You, you can put things in a blender. Um, that's one simple way to approach this. And I, I kind of stumbled into something there, not really knowing yep. any of the science that frankly, none of the science had been published in 2012. Um, but uh, the gut microbiome. So I'm going to, I'm going to look, I, I'm already out of the closet here. You guys know I'm a nerd. So I'm going to get a little nerdy, but then I want to come back to simple take home points that any person can apply to their life that like, mm -hmm. regardless of whether you love the nerdy part or not, you just do this and your gut will be healthier as a result. So um, what I wanted to say is that, let me sort of describe what these short chain fatty acids do. Uh, first of all, James, many people have heard of the expression leaky gut. Mm -hmm. All right, so leaky gut is actually an appropriate term because what's happened is that the lining of the intestines has like basically there are holes that exist in that in that gut barrier. And now things can basically sneak into the bloodstream toxins that are not supposed to be there. And there's sort of, um, if you break it down, there's three things that take place when a person has a leaky gut, by the way, the medical term that I would use is dysbiosis, but we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the three things are less good guy bacteria, 
-hmm. more bad guy bacteria, the inflammatory guys. Yeah. And um, breaking open of the uh, gut barrier with the breakdown of what we call tight junction proteins. Mm -hmm. If you want to fix leaky gut, people like want to know, how do you fix it? Short chain fatty acids fix it. Wow. They increase the growth of the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. They directly suppress the bad guys. I'm talking about like Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli. And actually, they fix the tight junction proteins. Um, in the United States, colorectal cancer is the number two cause of cancer death. Mm -hmm. There are multiple mechanisms by which short chain fatty acids actually suppress and can eliminate cancer cells. Wow. Uh, our immune system, we have seen the epidemics of autoimmune diseases, allergic diseases, short chain fatty acids help to shape the immune system so that they don't become confused. 70% of your immune system is in your gut. Mm -hmm. We've seen the metabolic issues that exist, obesity, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. All four of these things can be addressed and improved with short chain fatty acids. Um, we could keep going. There's a number of different ways, but they, wow. they, they spread throughout the entire body. They go to the brain. Your brain yeah. has a barrier, just like your gut. We call it the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. The tight junction proteins are there too. Mm. And there are people who complain of brain fog and their doctor rolls their eyes and goes, that's not real. Wow. Is that like leaky brain now? Leaky brain syndrome? Oh my God, I'm getting it. This is and insane. These short chain what? fatty acids travel from the gut, enter the bloodstream, and through and go through the blood. Pass to, through the blood brain barrier. To the blood brain barrier where they can fix the tight junction proteins there. Jeez. Okay. So these short chain fatty acids, this is this is the goal. This is what we're what we're needing. That's an incredible breakthrough. What what incredible and, and the problem is that if I walk out on the street in the United States and I don't think it's radically different in, in other Western countries, like it might be a little bit better in Australia yeah. or UK, but I walk out in the US right now, nineteen out of twenty people that I run into are not even getting the minimal recommended amount of fiber. Because mm. we're just not eating it. Because what we're getting is a diet that is like Again, there are many forms of a healthy diet. I'm not proposing here today that yes. the only yeah. healthy diet is a vegan diet. Mm. But what I'm saying is that our current diet, which is 10% plants, which is mm. the part that has fiber. Is that really the current statistics, really, in the, the standard American diet is 10% plants? Because we are 60% ultra-processed. Okay, so ultra-processed would include some plant material but it's just ultra processed food, right? It's like, you know, soy lecithin and like, you know, highly refined gr grain products or yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. I get kind of pissed because when they like slap the label plant-based onto it, it makes it sound mm. like it's healthy food. That's bullshit. Sorry for my language. Yeah. yeah. You can edit that out if you need to. No, it's your, it's basically, you just said your last name. So it's okay. <laughs> That's all I was saying. <laughs> bullshit bullshit image. Image. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and in, in, in the U.S., 30% of our diet is animal products. Now, look, again, like, yeah. I just yeah. I just think that it's it's unbalanced. And mm -hmm. so uh, so I, I think that this is one of the keys. Now, you mentioned before prebiotics. So let's define these terms because mm -hmm. I think it's important. Um, many people have heard of probiotics. Those are bacteria that have been shown to have benefits for human health. They're good bacteria. They have to be good. Yeah. yeah. We have those living inside of us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we can certainly take a capsule and there are people who definitely get a benefit from that. There is no doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have probiotics living inside of us. Mm. We just need to feed them. Mm. And their food are the prebiotics. And prebiotic basically means any uh, sort of nutritional item that will modify the gut microbiome and result in better human health. Mm. Now, there are three main types of prebiotics that everyone needs to know. Fiber, resistant starches, which basically is fiber. I mean, it's, it's, it's essentially the yeah, same yeah. thing. Yeah. And then finally, polyphenols. Mm -hmm. um, so 
these three things, this is the nourishment, this is the fuel for your microbiome. Wow. All three come from plants. Totally. So when we're only 10% of our calories from plants, and like, by the way, the number one plant in that 10% is French fries. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Which is like doused in like, you know, yeah, rancid. Right. Bah, bah. Exactly. So yeah, ridiculous. Um so when we're when we're frankly just not consuming these things, we're starving these bugs. Mm. Now, when you do feed them, there's this formula, James, that I think is really cool. And I think when you when people hear this, they're gonna know more than their doctor does prebiotics all right what i was just talking about we can call it fiber yes, but yes. prebiotics yes plus yes. probiotics uh -huh. equals postbiotics basically what i just said is when fiber comes into contact with your gut microbes you are producing short chain fatty acids and okay, those yeah. are the postbiotics and at the end of the day it's not the fiber and it's not the microbes. It's what the microbes create from the fiber. That's what matters. Wow. Wow. Okay, this is so huge. And I'm just processing it right now because, I mean, in the West and in the health circles, we've become, you know, conditioned to, okay, well, we understand what like medium chain triglycerides are and lauric acid from coconut oil and all these things, but nobody's talking about our short chain fatty acids. You know, this is big. So thank you. And then, and then nobody's really explaining this process that we need to feed them and it's not them that is the result. It's, you know, what they create that is what is so powerful, you know? So it's, they're like little soldiers working for us. It's so beautiful. Or you could think of it as you send the ingredients and they're the chefs and they're going to make a delicious mm. meal. <laughs> yeah. I now, love it. you mentioned before, so I just want to, because um, I think, you know, you were kind of priming me for this, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that there's different types of fiber. This is an important point because um, the person at home who's listening to us is thinking right now, oh, I need more fiber. But I want you to understand that actually this goes beyond just counting grams. It's actually more fun. <laughs> it's actually a lot more fun than that. Every plant has fiber. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, seeds, nuts, legumes, and actually mushrooms have fiber. Uh, even though mushrooms technically are not plants, they're actually fungi. Yeah, yeah. So they all have fiber. And every plant has specific types of fiber. There are many types. And these microbes that live inside of us, James, is 38 trillion, like the number of species for each of us is at least hundreds, maybe a thousand. And each species has like its own personality, its own skill set, and its own dietary preferences. They don't all eat the same thing. And fiber is not just generically fiber. Different plants feed different families of gut bugs. And if we think about these gut bugs, I mentioned this earlier, it's not about the individual bugs. It's about the collective whole and what they're capable of doing working as a team. So when we think about like Avengers Endgame, all right, if it's just Spider-Man, he's going to get his butt kicked. That's not yeah, enough. Yeah. No, no. And if you give me 10 Spider-Mans, 10, 10 Spider-People, well, that's not <laughs> enough either, people. right? Because yeah, yeah. their skill sets overlap and it's like they're all the same. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need Thor. Sometimes you need Iron Man. Sometimes you need the Hulk. Yeah. And that's our gut microbiome. They're all coming together and collectively they are stronger because they each have unique skills. So what we want is we want to feed all of them. And this has actually been proven, James, through study after study, like literally hundreds of studies at this point, where mm -hmm. when we look at disease, when disease shows up, like some of the things we've been talking about today, 
irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, but also yeah. metabolic diseases, diabetes, uh, obesity, or autoimmune diseases that go down the line. Literally every autoimmune disease, you will find injury to the yeah. gut microbiome and leaky gut. Yeah, yeah. When, when we look at what's happening under the hood, you discover that the gut microbiome has a loss of diversity. You're, you're basically taking the Avengers and removing half the team, and now they're struggling to keep up. So we want to build a microbiome that's as broadly diverse as possible. Diversity is resilient. Diversity is tough. And it's ready for all the challenges. And the way that we do that is by feeding them. And the way that we feed all of them, when they all have different dietary preferences, is we eat a wide variety. So if there's only one thing that I ask people to take away from our conversation from today, this is literally it. The single, in the American Gut Project, which is the largest study to date to allow us to connect a person's microbiome to their diet and lifestyle choices, the single most powerful predictor of a diverse, um, strong gut microbiome was the diversity of plants in their diet. People with the healthiest guts were eating at least 30 varieties of plants per week. And so I say, stop counting calories, start counting plants. Stop counting grams of fiber, start counting plants. And if you make this a core philosophy and you do it when you're in the kitchen and you do it in the supermarket and you do it when you sit down and you put your plate together, you will be healing, you will be optimizing, you will be supporting a healthy gut microbiome. And this is how you ultimately get to accomplish your health goals. Empower them, they will empower you even more. Wow, that's so beautiful. Um, I'm thinking of so much as you're talking, you know, part of it is, you know, you got to feed the troops, you know, when you're abounding an offensive, you got to feed the troops and there, you know, there's all different types of troops, you know, and like the Avengers Endgame, like you said, that was a great analogy. And then to finish on this idea that diversity is key, um, is so profound. And, and I love when these types of moments happen, I can feel the synapses connecting in my brain because you have people like Daniel Vitalis, who is more of like a wild food expert. And his biggest statement is that we're not eating the diversity of foods we used to eat as primal people. And he said we would have, you know, 50, 100 different species of plants, and now we're down to 30, and they're so heavily domesticated, they're so heavily modified, and they're no longer their wild variety. They're seedless, they're just these weak, you know, domesticated plants that we have in our supermarkets, as opposed to going out into the, the farmer's markets and into the fields or eating the dandelion that's growing in your backyard and getting, you know, getting amongst it, you know, and increasing your diversity. And this is an ancient philosophy, and you've just told me the biggest gut project in America says that what our indigenous people did was correct. I, I just love it. I love when anthropology and science overlap. Well, be, because I think that they're, because what you, I, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but I would assume that in 2007, part of your message was that there is wisdom in these ancient traditions. Mm. And, um, you know, Ayurveda has been down around for thousands of years, traditional Chinese medicine, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. You don't refine your craft over thousands of years without kind of having something going on that you believe to be true, that you know to be true. And it's mm -hmm. just not a it's just not a coincidence that mm -hmm. the, the language that they may, that they may use may be different, but that ultimately what they're describing turns out to be what we find in science is true. And, um, so, and it's just, you know, it's just, um, it's not going to happen as the result of our modern food system. It's just not. So like they, the food system wants you to get your calories from three plants, wheat, soy, and corn. That's it. You only get three. And corn, I know. And those things absolutely, you know, are not the best foods for the gut either. I mean, speaking of the experts I speak to, they're like, whoa, these things challenge the gut. GMO corn, um, soy, and modified 
wheat are not really high on the list of like powerful gut healing foods all three so all three of those things uh in the case of soy and corn they've both been genetically modified to allow for yes. spraying with glyphosate and um Wheat is not necessarily genetically modified to be re in, to be tolerant to glyphosate. They actually don't want it to be, because when you harvest wheat, you have to dry it out, and so if you spray it with glyphosate, it dries out faster. So yeah, it's a desiccant. It's a desiccant. So all three, we're three for three on that one, and that's seventy five percent of the calories that come from plants across the globe. And so are you anti those foods when a patient walks into your door with gut issues? You're like, hey, you got to get off the corn, wheat, soy. That's like a first step. Or you're more put in the good stuff. It'll crowd out the bad stuff. I mean, where do you stand on that scale? And, and do you believe there's a process to it? Like many of the, the integrated practitioners and doctors that specialize in this that I've spoken to say, okay, first, stop putting fuel on the fire. Stop aggravating the gut. Second, seal the gut with certain things. Third, start repopulating. Where do you sit on those sort of topics as we as we round out here? Because I just know that there's going to be some pretty high end people on this call going, wait, we need we need this. I get it. Eat more fiber, be diverse. But where do you stand on those two points? I guess what foods to eliminate, and is there a process by which you recommend people go through, or is it not necessarily yeah, the case? We, could, we have so much more that we could talk about. <laughs> I know. I, that's a big one to dump on the end, but I, I want to. I want to cover it. Well, so I'll do my best. Part of it. Part of it is that we could certainly do sometime another conversation and tackle these things. And the listeners, like, if that's what you guys want, let it be heard, mm -hmm. and then it happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is a lot of the stuff that I break down in my books. So okay. my first Good. book had six hundred references, and my second book, my, which is a cookbook, my cookbook has four hundred references. <laughs> wow. So. Um, all right, I think there's nuance to these things. So I'm not gonna categorically vilify these foods. All right, what I mean by that is that I actually don't think, th there are different forms of soy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the ones that the food industry wants to offer to us are causing harm for a number of reasons that include glyphosate. Mm -hmm. There are different forms of wheat. And again, in the ways yeah. that it's being processed, it's problematic. But can we, are there forms that are good? Yes. Yeah. Got right. It. Is edamame good? Yes. Is miso good? Yes. Tempeh, natto. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think, and yeah. I think, I, you know, hopefully we all see that and understand that, that we don't want to paint with such broad strokes that we miss yes. out on good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a process? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. There is a process. And I would be, uh, insincere or or offering a false nar narrative to pretend that this is easy for everyone my yeah. patients are people with digestive health issues these are the people who struggle with this transition that i'm describing the most mm -hmm. because when your gut is not in a good place and you need your gut to process fiber because we can't do it mm. then you will struggle I am not suggesting in any way, and I hope people are here's, hear, hear me on this because yeah. Um, yeah. I think like when you take things out of context, they can get crazy, but I'm not suggesting any way that you flog yourself with food and make yourself miserable and reduce your quality of life. I would never want that for you as a medical doctor. But what I do want is I want to make you healthy again mm. and make your gut stronger and restore function and allow you to take foods that you currently see as being the enemy and turn them into your friend. Because mm. that's actually possible. Nice. And that is the, uh, so it actually is a nice transition to the end of the show because my first book, Fiber Fueled, so Fiber Fueled came out in 2020. It was a New York Times bestseller and it has sold mm. about 200,000 copies so far. Wow, congratulations, and that's amazing. Thank you. And um, it was my passion project. And it was me saying to the world, yo, like, why are we not talking about short chain fatty acids? Mm. What, when 19 out of 20 people are fiber deficient, why are we, why is this not on the news every night? Mm. Um, let me show you this revolution in science that's taking place literally right now in my world as a gastroenterologist, let me show this to you. 
And mm -hmm. you can apply what I'm teaching you to your own life to empower yourself to better health. That's what Fiber Field was. But there's unfinished business and you're bringing it up. You're, you're, you're kind of uh, pointing this out at the end of the show and it's a valid point. There were people that were that would reach out. There were people who would reach out to me through the internet, or they would come and see me in the office, and they would say to me, "Doctor B, I actually believe you, and I want to eat the way that you're describing, but I am struggling with this, and I don't feel well, and so I needed to create a way to help people overcome food intolerances." Mm -hmm to understand, because this is actually like, if you take a group of people that have leaky gut or irritable bowel syndrome, almost all of them have food intolerances. Absolutely, even more than normal because the food's responding to so many of those particles that are leaking into the bloodstream. So exactly, big time. Big time. So we need to, so, so I have, you know, hopefully during this hour, I've convinced you that these short chain fatty acids can be part of the solution. And that's enough of a starting point to say that we want fiber to be on board. But how do we bring it on board? And that's yeah. a very big part of what I teach in the Fiber Fields cookbook, um, where I give a complete breakdown of food intolerances. I actually have two recipe based food intolerance protocols, one for FODMAP intolerance and one for histamine intolerance. Okay. And, um, and then the last thing is I teach people how to ferment and make sourdough and sprouts. And these are different tools that you can apply. I mean, basically, I want to empower the individual with the tools that they need to take back their gut health, overcome food intolerances and, and, you know, basically thrive. Nice. I love it. Amazing. Um, Maybe we need a follow-up call because I'm seeing there's also a picture of artichokes in the background that I think about low FODMAP and there's like so many questions around that. And, um, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, brilliant work that you're doing that cookbook. And I encourage people to go check out Dr. B's website, theplantfedgut.com. You'll find uh, everything you need to find there. You know, I'm so proud of you uh, and excited for you being the... Um, what do we call this guy? You're this explorer, right? Of a lost world, you know, and it's this lost world inside of us. And I think it's so beautiful that you're doing that work. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, colonization, pardon the pun, was part of how we spread Western ideals around the world, good and bad, definitely lots of bad and some good infrastructure and things that came out of it. And in a way, you're helping colonize a new era of uh, bacteria in people's uh, in people's guts and i think that's really profound um and you're doing it not as a nation state or not as a uh spreading a particular power but you're doing it to help people liberate themselves from from pain and suffering i think that's a really beautiful uh beautiful mission so thank you so much dr b for your time today uh and for the research that you're doing and for enlightening the world with these topics and um keep reporting back and, and maybe we should organize a follow-up call because I've really enjoyed uh, what we've covered today. It's been really profound. Thank you so much. I do. I do appreciate you having me on James. And I thank you for the, you know, the inspiration that you gave me and my personal journey towards becoming this person that I am today, where, you know, six years ago, a uh, couple hundred followers who would have thought that you and I would be having this conversation after writing two books. Yeah, true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the great work and we'll speak again soon. Have a beautiful day. Thank you, my friend. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends and family on social media or leave a comment below. We love hearing from you. If you want to find out more and sign up to our podcast to make sure you don't miss an episode, head to foodmatters.com forward slash podcast. And I look forward to seeing you next time.